What's going on guys, this is Psyche, and after a long break, we're back with another weapon showcase. But before that, I just want to thank Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Now, a quick glance at my YouTube analytics will reveal that a big portion of my fanbase is ranged 18 to 24 years old, and your area of origins are all over the place. That being said, I assume that most of you are in your last years of high school or just beginning college. And if there's one point in life where you have the most free time before starting work, it is now. And if you like to play games or watch shows in your spare time just like me, I have some good news for you. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount on its premium services. You can get a 3-year subscription for just $1 and 39 cents a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. If where you live is unfairly targeted by licensing rights or currency conversions with just a click of a button, you can enjoy fast speed internet services to safely view your favorite shows as well as save money on online shopping. Oh, and did I mention that Atlas VPN will notify you of malicious links or ads beforehand as well as offer protection on unlimited devices? This deal only lasts until the end of January, so be sure to get Atlas VPN by clicking on the link in the video description below. That's a three-year subscription for just $1.39 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Link below. Again, thank you Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Today, we'll be taking a look at the Queen's Rapier, which coincidentally was the first weapon I've unlocked when I first played this DLC. So let's just see what I can do with it. Um, just like all the other weapons, I've never really quite played with this weapon thoroughly just yet. It's This is still around like my second time trying it. So, in terms of how well this weapon's gonna perform, even I don't know that at this stage of the run. Now, the icon almost looks like a lightsaber if you look at it a certain way, and the effect of the Queen's Rapier goes something like this. After you hit something, there will be like a delay before a second tick of damage is dealt. And I do believe that the second instance of damage will be considered a critical hit. So it's kind of like this gimmick where it has like a delayed reward kind of system, where you hit something and then you gotta wait for like a split second before the actual damage is dealt. So this is kind of similar to DLT effects, but not really if you think about it. It follows a three hit combo, where you kind of slash the sword downward, one upward, and then one horizontally. And as for the attack speed, you'll see it having a bit of trouble with the flying monsters here in the toxic sewers. The real concern about this right now is that it doesn't have enough air time to really deal with the bats, and it has a really short range. Well, relatively short, compared to other brutality weapons. But since this is the early game, you can't really judge a weapon at this point of the run yet, because I find out that the damage scaling in the early game is a little bit wonky. So usually, weapons don't actually perform that well, regardless of which ones you use. And this is really just because you don't have enough scroll stats to begin with. And at this point, really all you have to do is just look at your skills, pick out anything that you like, and just go along with it. You don't really have to commit to a build at this stage of the game just yet. So let's just see what this new weapon can do. This was one of the first weapons I wanted to try out but I just really liked the deck of cards. So I wanted to try that one first, because it's been a while since I've had a tactics run on the channel, and I just wanted to break the loop with something. But now we're back to our scheduled programs, and we're gonna go back to brutality builds. That being said, I did say in my rant video that I am going to hold off on some of the weapon showcases, and this is true for the most part, and I know I'm gonna get a lot of questions about that in case, since people just really find critiques interesting, I guess. But in terms of the weapon design, I don't have a problem with it. And like, if they're willing to change the items to a way that it functions, then I will absolutely do showcases on them. And what I like about indie devs is that they actually listen to you. They have said that they are looking for fixes. So don't worry, I don't think things are gonna stay the way it is. For a very long time, they are going to fix it eventually. So as of now, I'm not sure which weapon I'm gonna showcase next. It's not really a matter of showcasing the weapons, it's a matter of wanting to go to the DLC areas, because I find that whenever you go to, like, the Queen boss fight, your build already has to be really fast. But if you go to Hand of the King, then you can really go there with any build. And what I like about the weapons is that I don't think there's something inherently wrong with each and one of them. I just think that they need a little boost, and then they will be viable. So I really like what the Maw of the Deep is able to do, throwing out a shark. I mean, who doesn't love that, right? But I just don't really want to wait until the third hit to do it, because it is a cool effect. A lot of the weapons that I see have really cool effects, but I just want to wait to get to them sooner, if that even makes sense. So anyways, that's essentially like the rant portion of this video done. So to change the subject, and by the way, that was a very close call right there. My life flashed right before my eyes. 
What are you guys' favorite and least favorite weapons from the DLC? I think the other weapon that I wanted to take a look at is the Blade of Tomfus. There's something really cool about that weapon, but I'm not sure if it's glitched out at the moment, because the wording on the description can be a little bit ambiguous. I'm not sure exactly how to pull off the critical hit condition, but I will be showcasing it once I actually figure it out. Maybe it's just me that's not really getting the point, but we're just gonna live the curse in the corrupted prison. Still doing relatively well, I think in terms of damage, the Queen's Rapier is on par with how much is expected to be doing at this time, but what I really like about the Queen's Rapier so far is that if you deal enough damage, you can just hit something once and then just walk away, since you'll probably be certain that the critical hit is going to kill them. And the only other complaint that I have about it is that the animation I thought could look a bit better. I mean, since this is a weapon from the Queen, you would expect that the effects will be something similar to how she attacks you with it. Because she kind of slices up your screen, and I wondered if it's possible to do that with this weapon. I mean, right now it just looks like a line, and it glows a little bit. I mean, it's cool, but I just thought maybe it would look even cooler, since this is kind of like the Queen's signature weapon. So, alright, going into the Ancient Sewers, this is always my preferred route, and when you're on 5 BC, the scroll stat matters more than pretty much anything else, so you really gotta maximize what you have. So here I'm gonna do an interesting combo um, with Phaser as well as the Queen's Rapier. Now I'm pretty certain that you can do this with any hard-hitting weapon in general, but it's been a while since I've used Phaser, and this animation right here just looks really cool. Also, as of now, I am working on my second channel still. I have just finished editing the first video, and I'm doing the scripting as well as getting footage for the second. I think I'm gonna upload 4 to begin with, I'll let everybody know when it's actually finished, but I just figure that anything that doesn't involve gameplay footage is actually gonna take a lot of time to edit. But I mean, you'll eventually get used to it if you use those softwares a lot. And also, regarding this DLC, I'm still waiting on an update of sorts before I release a tier list. I could release one right now, but I'm almost absolutely certain that they're going to change some of these weapons going forward. And I just wanted to get like a clear understanding of what they had in mind, because I feel like a lot of the weapons have potential. It's just, it doesn't quite meet what I expect to be like a satisfactory weapon to begin with. I remember there was a time when survival weapons were slow, but they were not like one second per hit slow. You have stuff like Nutcracker, which is already pretty slow by the game standards, and now we have something like the Wrecking Ball, which I'm not sure how you're supposed to use. If there is a way to use it well, I would definitely want to know, because I have no idea how to use it. Another weapon that I don't understand is the hand hook. I'm not sure how many of you tried it, but I think what it does is that it pushes enemies like behind you. You almost push them backwards. You land the third hit, and then if you can push one into a wall, it will do critical damage. But the thing is though, I find it that more often than not, it will actually cause an inconvenience and actually be beneficial. Because on a flat platform like this one right here, you're just gonna push them back a couple spaces, and I don't see what's strategic about that. I'm sure you could just go into like a wall and then just let them teleport to you, but the thing is you can't do that in bosses. And even if I wanted to use it as a support weapon, it still takes too long to get that effect. I mean, why should I wait for the third hit to push enemies back when I can get it with the first hit instantly with Spartan Sandals? Another weapon I don't quite understand is the Gilded Yumi. Um, I feel like it should be Tactics and Survival as well. I don't think it should be Tactics exclusive unless they do something to change it. Now, as you guys may have seen, the Gilded Yumi has a really slow firing speed, and it doesn't really fit into the theme of Tactics, at least in my opinion. Now, it would be worth it if the damage is actually good, but unless you bump something into a wall, I'm afraid it does virtually very little damage. So we're gonna get into the Conjunctivious fight now. And something I noticed is that I decided to use Smoke Grenade. Why am I using Smoke Grenade? Well, I'm not so sure myself. I guess I just wanted to switch things up. However, this actually turned out to be one of my best investments I've made in this run. Because later on, you'll see that with the Queen's Rapier, in conjunction with the smoke bomb, you're able to do some really crazy stuff, and I'll show you guys that when we get to the DLC section. But I don't really think that I'm gonna struggle quite a lot with this fight in particular. Um, I mean, other than the fact that invisibility doesn't really work in bosses, sometimes it also disrupts their attack patterns. Like these tentacles right here, when I was invisible, they literally would not come outside. 
So I guess in conjunction with the Queen's Rapier, I'm also going to showcase the Smoke Bomb this time. Because I find out that the invisibility is not the only thing that's overpowered with it. And this will become very apparent later on into the run, when we actually encounter some other bosses. And I guess this weapon does a fairly decent job of clearing up this boss, because it actually manages to get some DLT effects in, since the Rapier is technically on a timer, if you really look at it that way. And here you'll just see me spamming the phaser thing, but, you know, it's really ambiguous whether or not you actually land somewhere close to the boss, since phaser is just phaser, you, you can't really change how it works. That being said, if you guys have any suggestions on how the new items can be changed, I would love to know. Again, Dead Cells does a really good job of listening to its player base, at least well, that's what I think. So I do think that they're working on a new project as we speak. Um, I'm not sure what that project is, but I guess we'll just have to see. If it turns out to be Dead Cells 2, I would happily play it. But as this fight is coming to a close, I just wanted to give you guys an update on the future of this channel. So I still do Dead Cells content, but something that's made me realize is that there's a lot of potential for video analysis types of videos. So I am going to plan some in the future, I'm not sure when it's going to be, but personally I really like doing them myself, I know a lot of you guys really like them too. Because I find that the content that I want to create, ultimately, um, just on YouTube, is video essays that will convince people that your unpopular opinion is actually valid. Like if you make someone else think twice about what they actually believed in, then that right there is quality content for me. For example, if someone titled a video, Attack on Titan is one of the greatest shows to exist. I'll be like, yeah, cool, but that's also like saying the sky is blue. You know, you're not really proving anything bombastic with that statement. However, if you made a video and titled it, Attack on Titan is flawed, that's gonna get my attention. And if I click on that video, and then I do think that their arguments make sense, that right there is what I think to be the best type of content on YouTube. But anyways, we're going up to the graveyard now, but that is essentially the type of content I want to create on my second channel, and maybe this one too, except maybe I'm gonna focus this one for gaming. Who knows? It has been confirmed by the devs that Dead Cells is getting at least another year's worth of updates, so I'm pretty excited about that, and in addition, I'm not sure whether or not there's gonna be another DLC that's coming out. I hope that is the case. And if it is, I will happily spend more time with this game. I mean, it's just really good. I mean, this game has given me so much value in the past two years. So enough said, we're gonna get the curse chest from the graveyard. And this is gonna be somewhat of an easy curse, I wanna say. Um, it, you'll see me being invisible here, but for some reason that slasher still saw me. So I'm not sure how invisibility actually works in this game. Sometimes it seems to be just broken. So not sure what to really think of that. But another thing that Smoke Bomb does is that it will actually increase your damage for your next attack. And I think this is the main reason why people actually use this skill. I originally thought it was a sleeper, honestly. Like I rated it like D tier on my first tier list for the channel. But after this video, my perception of it has definitely changed. So we're gonna do something very ambitious. We're going to the Undying Shores, which means we're fighting the Scarecrow. Because for me, Scarecrow is actually the hardest boss in the game. I'm not sure it's because the fight itself still bugs out sometimes. Scarecrow still attacks you like faster than any of the other bosses in the game. Not sure of whether or not this should be the case, but I don't really have too many complaints about it. Because this is not the end game. You can still choose to go to Timekeeper or Giant if you feel that you're not prepared for it. But that being said, I really enjoy the fact that you can get to the new Queen DLC areas from any second boss. So you have a lot more freedom of where you want to go. And this biome in particular is essentially... Well, actually, sometimes I compare this biome to the Garden Sepulchre, except maybe this biome slightly easier. But essentially, if your build is on par with the damage, you should be pretty much melting through everything by this point. And this does actually seem to be the case with the Queen's Rapier. I know some people say that the DPS isn't quite there, but I think it's okay. I don't think anything balance related has to be changed about this weapon. I think this weapon just works pretty well on its own, honestly. But in terms of range, in terms of horizontal range, it is pretty good. Um, you can reach things from quite a distance. It's really just the flying stuff that you gotta worry about. 
So just like in Toxic Sewers, I realized that I got hit by like the bats. And that's kind of the main issue with Queen's Rapier, but for these biomes where everything is flat, you can pretty much rest assured that you will be hitting everything. So we're going into the Scarecrow fight now. This is where I get a little nervous. I always get nervous when I fight this boss. I'm just really not used to the Scarecrow's moves, and in addition, it always moves so fast that sometimes you have trouble keeping up. So one thing that I would really like to see in this fight is indicators where Scarecrow is actually going to speed up its moves. Because for the most part, I can kind of guess when that's going to happen, but I can't really, like, accurately predict when its moves are going to become faster. And the thing I noticed is that if you fail, like, one parry, you're getting hit, like, a lot of times. So, like, a small problem kind of leads to a much bigger one. And that's one of the other issues that I have with this boss. So, already having expended a health flask, um, I was able to get it down, but this was not a favorable outcome, at least in my opinion. But finally, we're gonna move on to the actual meat of the run, the new content. So let's see how Queen's Rapier actually hold up against these tougher enemies. At this point, I did ditch Phaser because I thought the Cleaver just worked a lot better in the Scarecrow fight. But honestly, I think the Phaser would have done really well here too. And one thing that I noticed that seems to be happening a lot in this biome is that enemies drop you a lot of gems. I'm not sure whether or not this is intended, but it looks like every time I come here, I get like a lot more gold drops than usual. So I guess if you really like gold, you can come to the infested shipwreck, but again, this is the last biome before you get to make any changes to your loadout since the next two biomes after this are all bosses. So I am actually really enjoying the aesthetics of this biome so far. It is quite large, but I'm honestly okay with it. It kind of reminds me of a cavern in a way, but in terms of the aesthetics, in terms of the gameplay, I am all for the infested shipwreck. I think the coral floors is very different than what we've seen so far, but I do find that the hitboxes for the enemies can be a bit weird sometimes, because you don't want the enemies to actually break the coral floors, otherwise it's gonna land you in a lot of danger. So, something that I said in my rant video is that in this biome, your best strategy is to beat every single enemy before they even reach you. Um, this is technically true in pretty much every single scenario, but the thing is though, because of those coral floors, your terrain situation is a lot more unpredictable. Because if you wait for an enemy to attack, they're gonna break some of the coral floors. Now you have to watch your footing, which is another variable you have to worry about. And plus, there are so many bombers in this level that it makes you feel like the bombs are just being showered on top of you. Um, I'm not sure if this is like a 5BC exclusive thing. I would have loved a bit more enemy variety here, but I do like what they have so far. But again, this is subject to change. They can always just do this with a future update. And another thing that I found it to be a bit weird, and this isn't pointed out by me, by the way, but someone else pointed this out, but there are no lore rooms in this biome, which is a little odd because this is the only normal biome in this DLC. So again, this might be something that they might add in the future, but I just find it to be a little odd that they haven't done that yet. I mean, again, in terms of the aesthetics, I'm really loving this biome so far. But maybe there's gonna be some kind of like captain's diaries or like the journal of a pirate or something. But as you saw in that transition room, I picked up extended healing and I just fast forwarded that footage because I don't want people waiting around like 10 seconds to see me heal all the way back up. But I just wanted to make sure that I did it, just to make sure that people know that where this extra health is coming from. That being said, I am two health flasks down, and in this chase sequence, I am going to figure out some of like, um, I think that's Kaleope's attack patterns. So I feel like when she's directly below or diagonal of you, she's gonna do this attack where she like extends the Wrecking Ball. So that is probably your best chance to dodge. And just for references, I would have really preferred it if we can use the Wrecking Ball the same way as this boss uses it. I mean, she swings it so fast, so why can't we, you know? So we're heading into the first boss fight in a way. So she relatively has low health, but the problem that you'll see me struggle a little bit with here is still the attack timings. I do try to parry it, I can't kind of predict what she's about to do. So thanks to Rampart right there, I managed to save myself from a hit. So Kaleope is down, she's gonna drink the health flask, and we're actually just gonna move on. And in case you are wondering why I'm using the Rampart shield, this idea was inspired by, I think, like a video I saw 
Um, I'm pretty sure you can use the Rampart Shield pretty much anywhere you want. But I think with a lot of the um, the delayed effect weapons, so such as maybe the hook hand, or maybe even this weapon where the third hit does the most amount of damage, the Rampart Shield actually ensures that you're able to land all of your hits in the combo. Which means you're actually rewarded for learning how to parry, as well as actually committing to the full combo. And honestly, it is one of the more underrated shields in the game. So. As you saw there for a brief second, I was able to climb up that platform because I had an extra jump. So I'm gonna try to hit these bosses a little bit, but as you can see, they can actually destroy the platforms where you pull the rope to like, fly yourself upwards, which is pretty smart if you think about it, but you just have to be quick. So this is the second of the third bosses. It's not that much different from what I've seen. The Bow Guardian, I'm not sure what her name is, I just kind of forgot. But she really only has like three moves. She's gonna rain the arrows down, she kind of smashes downward with like a melee slam, like that one right there. And she's also gonna shoot arrows at you, which they can all be dodged relatively easily. And you also have Kaleope coming in now and then. But once you get used to the attack patterns, these first two fights, at least in my opinion, are not that bad. So once the Bow Guardian is by herself, this fight pretty much becomes like a cakewalk. I mean, she's kind of like a pest that's just buzzing on the side, one that causes enough nuisance that makes you watch your footings. And we're going to approach the third and most dangerous portion of this fight, and that is Cleo. And for some reason, she does so much damage to you. And if only the Blade of Tomfus can do that when we're actually using it. So I think in terms of priority of who to avoid, you're definitely going to want to avoid Cleo first. Because the damage done by the Tonfus just do so much to you. But luckily, she only has like one or two attacks, at least in this chase sequence. So just like that, because I predicted that Kaleo Pei is right below me, she's going to slam upwards with the Wrecking Ball. So you can just dodge out of the way at that moment and it just continue climbing. At least that's one thing that I found out. So heading into the third fight, what I realized is that you actually get two pieces of food. One before the second fight and the one before the third. But I think on lower boss cell levels, you actually get like a 50% heal food instead of um, just the 15%. And plus on 5 BC, they're both uh, infected by the malaise. So that's something you gotta watch out for. But honestly, in this fight, malaise doesn't really amount to much. I mean, sure, they're probably gonna hit you faster and they're probably going to deal more damage. But at the end of the day, your malaise increases so fast by this point, what does it really matter, right? So as always, we're going to prioritize the mace monster first. And I don't know if you saw there, you might have to run that back. But what I was able to do is that I used the smoke bomb, and then because of the damage boost, there's something wonky going on with bosses when you do that. I just instantly killed one of the monsters. That might be something you guys might want to look into. I'm not sure what causes that because as far as I know, that effect is not consistent. At least not what I think. So we're finally going to defeat the third guardian and thus ending the fight. So I am not at all perfect with this biome yet. There's still a lot of things I can work on. I still cannot completely predict the flow of the fights. But enough said, let's fight the queen. Um, again, I was a little bit disappointed because I am wearing the servant's outfit. I thought she would actually acknowledge that and say something. But I mean, you can't expect everything to go your way, right? So as for the queen, I've actually more or less figured out her movesets as well. It's a very interesting boss, to say the least. And in a second here, when she actually does like the screen splitting attack, you'll see that how ranged builds have like a much bigger advantage than melee builds. I think in terms of health, she doesn't actually have that much health. So this is the attack I was talking about. And right there, just again, I was able to do like the smoke bomb quote unquote cheese attack with the Queen's Rapier. Again, I'm not sure what causes that in particular, but I guess that is something that smoke bomb can be used for. So with this boss, what I'm doing is that I'm just placing a turret in the middle of the arena. And what that allows me to do is still damage the queen even though she's in this phase where she's attacking you. Because you can still hit the queen while she's splitting your screen. Except with melee builds, that's considerably harder to do. Which means using ranged builds will give you an advantage because you can save time and get even more damage in while she's doing that. But I guess you can say the same for turrets as well. 
Um, here I try to do something cheeky, I try to push her into the void, but I don't think that's happening with this setup, because I wanted one of the achievements. But oh well, what can you do, right? I'm gonna expand my last flask charge, and that is the end of the fight. So what did I think of the Queen's Rapier? I think it is a good weapon, at least better than some of the other ones that we got. I'm not gonna name any names, but I think you all know what I'm talking about. And for those that are new to the channel, this is the ending that you get for beating the Queen. Unfortunately, again, no new content on 5BC. So enjoy the ending guys, and I'll see you all next time.